the usual suspects. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Hello, and welcome to Silver Screen Showcase. My name is Jared Malone, and I'll be your host as we take you behind the camera and into the minds of some of Santa Barbara County's most talented filmmakers. My guest today is director Michael Love, whose film Santa Ynez River Wilderness was highlighted at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. We're going to take a look at a clip right now, but when we return, we'll sit down with the filmmaker himself and find out more about his creative process. And when we're trying to preserve ecosystems, we always look at food webs. And we always try to have a food web that is rich and it has all of its links. If you eliminate any link on this food chain, it unbalances. If I manage Coal Point Reserve, which is a place there's a reserve in the middle of an urban area. There we're missing coyotes and we're missing mountain lions. Because of that, we have an explosion of skunks and raccoons, which then eat the eggs of ground nesting birds. The caddisfly um, lays their eggs on the river and creeks and the larvae lives its entire life in the river until it hatches into a caddisfly. And they are food item for fish and even other insects. So it's very important to all the insects that live in the river and the creek to be completely camouflaged. And the way the caddisfly does this is it, it collects parts of the river leaves or rocks and glues on its back. So there's ones that glue only gravel, other species that glue only uh, dead leaves. So different species use different, have different preferences for what they choose to put on their back. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here. It's my pleasure. So please, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, um, I grew up in Mexico City. I was there till I was 17, and uh, I'd say that's an important part of, uh, of my life because uh, a lot of the films I've worked on since have a relationship with Mexico. Okay. Uh, and uh, after I left Mexico, I um, went to music school, got a degree in composition, and uh, went on to start writing screenplays since I couldn't make a living as a composer. <laughs> right. Uh, and um, when my first film was produced, it kind of started uh, uh, things going, and um, I've been making films ever since. That's excellent. So the clip that we just saw, we were looking at the caddisfly. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about the caddisfly? Well, this is one of the uh, amazing things that happened in the making of this documentary, which was I learned so much, and uh, I had no idea about the caddisfly. Christina Sandoval, just came up with that spontaneously. She found one in the river and started talking about it. And uh, it was uh, phenomenal how uh, that happened over and over again with uh, lots of the people who became uh, participants in the film, where I didn't know about it and I learned about it in the process of making it. And uh, it was, that was really a wonderful factor. I really like the diversity of the film and so much information. I mean, I felt like I was watching something on National Geographic and just the fine attention to detail, especially with the caddis fly and with Christina Sandoval. I really, I, th I found that amazing. Um, well, especially, uh, yeah, uh, the, the plane engine. 
how did you, was that by accident or did you know about the the World War II engine? Well, I had stumbled on that about uh, 10 years ago and wondered what it was. And when I started making this film, I, and I had done a little bit of research, there used to be a, li uh, uh, a place in Goleta that was an air, um, aircraft museum. Okay. And I couldn't find out anything there. And uh, I did find through the internet some experts about that period and that engine. And they knew everything. They tracked down the exact year and what accidents had happened in that area. And that's how I found out <laughs> exactly what happened. That's cool. Um, could you elaborate a little bit about the snowy plover dilemma? Well, the snowy plover is, is really exemplary of uh, what happens when humans move in and change the habitat of uh, wild animals. Uh, because there aren't top predators um, in that area, because it's surrounded by, uh, it's really an urban area with a little preserve in the middle of it, they have no um, bobcats, coyotes, or mountain lions. And so skunks and raccoons have just proliferated and they're eating the plover eggs. So it's a constant battle to try and uh, keep them breeding and uh, keep them going. Christina actually has done an amazing job, Christina Sandoval, who is the director of that preserve and she's brought them back from a very small number to I can't remember how many it is now but something like 20 times what they used to be so so far that's been a real success story that's excellent now on the topic of Christina Sandoval she seems like a very prominent character in the film how did you uh, become friends with Christina how did you build a relationship and how much time did you end up spending filming with her well it's really interesting because I had been looking for a biologist for this film for, I don't know, almost uh, three years. And I just hadn't quite uh, found the right person. I did the you know, anthropology section, I did the geology section, I did just about all the principal photography of the film before I found Christina. And curiously enough, I didn't find her through looking for biologists, I found her because she has the nature preserve there. And when I found out about the nature preserve and that she was a director, I wrote her an email and uh, asked if she might be interested in uh, participating in the film and uh, she said, sure, I'd love to. That's Met excellent. With her and I just thought this is a match made in heaven because she's so charismatic the camera loves her and uh, she was just a natural uh, so I feel really lucky that was kind of something that just came out of the uh, heavens so to speak excellent and completed the film and was just the missing ingredient okay well let's take a look at a clip during the night this coyote marks territory Hours later, another follows suit. Gray foxes are often heard by campers at night who mistake their cries for a young mountain lion. They can climb trees like a cat and are omnivorous. The plentiful deer are the main food of Paradise Canyon's top predator, the mountain lion. Solitary by nature and nocturnal, they are rarely spotted. Genetically, they are more closely related to the domestic cat than the African lion, and they cannot roar. This deer could have been eaten by a mountain lion. One thing that I think is interesting here, there is not much left. The mountain lion himself could have eaten most of the flesh but other animals that are not big enough to kill a deer can continue to come day after day for weeks until they take everything that is left here. Well, that was striking, the footage of the fox and the coyote in the night vision. I mean, how did you do that? Well, that was uh, using uh, one of my favorite toys, which after trying to get um, footage of, of the wildlife with my big camera running around, setting it up and having them be gone by the time I focused, I got one of these, which is a trail cam. 
And it's the newer one where actually it senses the heat of anything that's alive that walks by it with an infrared sensor. Oh, wow. And then it uses black light LEDs that the wildlife can't see to illuminate a night scene. And uh, you just leave it out there parked on a trail that you know the wildlife is using and then come and switch out the SD card and see what you caught. Wow. So uh, that's been so much fun. Fortunately, I was able to get it to match the frame rate of um, my other camera, my big camera. Definitely. And uh, so it all worked together and uh, it was really a joy to be able to, it's almost like a nanny cam on the wildlife. You know? right. <laughs> you just see what they're doing without them knowing and you get this great natural behavior. I I really, really appreciate that aspect of the film because, you know, a lot of these scenes you wouldn't normally see, humans wouldn't wouldn't be there to witness, so right. that really comes in handy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Another, another element out in the field that I was curious about is your warm audio with your lavaliers. When you're out there in such vast emptiness, how do you get such dialed-in audio? Well, the lavaliers actually often were a backup audio, and the main audio was through uh, a Rode uh, NTG3, and when it was windy, I, you know, I had a blimp. That that microphone has really wonderful sound, great presence. It's great for the field. So that was really the principal um, default audio. And when there would be, an, and sometimes we mixed the uh, uh, lavaliers in with, uh, you know, with the um, uh, shotgun mic. Okay. But Generally, it was it was the roads and uh, a road, and I highly recommend it. Definitely. So one of my favorite scenes in the film is the scene with the black bear. Now he seems to be having just the greatest time <laughs> over there. How how did you do that? Well, that's from uh, some trail cams that are uh, parked in uh, undisclosed preserve. <laughs> okay, I understand the reasons uh, and, behind that. Um, they have, uh, there's some amazing footage of these bears using these. It's actually a catter, cattle watering hole. Okay, because it looks so, like someone built a little I know. swimming well, pool Well, it there. was built for cattle. Okay. And uh, it, what was amazing was on hot days, the bears started coming and they got used to using it. They loved it. So you see there's uh, several shots of different bears, but this guy just seemed to be uh, having, love, a, <laughs> having a blast that. in there. And he kind of gives a little kiss to the camera at the end there, <laughs> like, he, like he knew that he was being watched, and I, I loved that part. The cameras need to be, in, when, for bears, they need to be in a little metal encasement oh. because the bears will just swat them and uh, bite them and, and okay. destroy them, so uh, they're yeah, curious the about side. everything. How is that, leaving equipment out in the field? Are you ever worried? that when you go back you know someone will have taken it was it was it uh, that was a concern to me initially and uh, now um, and but I never had that happen in fact in some of my trail cam shots I see people coming up and go oh look at that camera hikers uh, but no right. one no one actually took anything okay uh, thank God and I do have now now I have a lock box and it's locked to the tree and you really couldn't do much to the camera uh, so but yeah, you, you do feel a little concerned, and ideally the camera's in a place where very few people go, which, right. is, which is where I got most of those nice uh, Sometimes shots. private property as well, so uh, yes, as Christina well. Sandoval, like I know that's her preserve. land. So. Exactly, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, right now we're gonna take a look at a clip about the acorn woodpecker and sure. the legacy of the Shumash, and when we Excellent. come back, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Sounds great, thank you. This lovable clown lives in a commune of six to eight birds. A family of acorn woodpeckers will occupy a valley oak for many generations, almost like a bird dynasty, and create elaborate granaries for sustenance during the winter when they harvest insects from the captive acorns. They are always cheerfully busy, working together, raising young, and storing food. And they're not above raiding an apple tree. The acorn woodpecker is territorial and aggressive to most other birds who invade their family tree. This band-tailed pigeon looks peaceful 
but is ready to fend off angry dive-bombing woodpeckers, and even a tough crow. Seen here hitching a ride is a resourceful European starling, brought to America in the late 19th century because they appear in Shakespeare's Henry IV, a hundred starlings were released in New York City's Central Park. Their North American numbers today top 200 million, sometimes crowding out native birds. As bird watcher Jeffrey Rosen put it, it isn't their fault that they treated an open continent much as we ourselves did. Standing here in my own um, land where my ancestors lived, I'm just listening to the water rushing along the, the river or stream here and imagining what it was like. The peace, the calm, the quiet, the wind, the trees, all the plants, all the rock, the sky. Um, they call it the Great Spirit, but I call it God. My name is Ernestine Ignacio de Soto, and I come from six generations of tribal people here, clan, however you refer to them, that inhabited this entire area, six villages. That was just so amazing to see Ernestine Ignacio de Soto. Could you tell us a little bit about the acorn woodpecker and the Chumash? Well, um, the acorn woodpecker is a good example of uh, native wildlife, and in fact they occupy a valley oak for generations, sometimes five or six generations, could be a hundred years or more. And uh, they build all these granaries in the tree, and that's what they use for sustenance during the winter. They don't eat the acorns, they eat the bugs in the acorns. Really? Now, uh, there are non-native birds, such as the starlings, which were brought to the United States because they appear in Shakespeare. Right. And uh, 100 were released in Central Park. Now there's 200 million. And they're crowding out native birds, much in the way that, you know, uh, European settlers came out and crowded out Native Americans. Uh, that is part of the story in the film, and, and um, Ernestine is uh, directly descended, and it's been tra traced by mitochondria DNA, uh, to the villages in the upper Santinez River. It's amazing. So uh, she really is uh, part of the, um, the Indian culture that used to be living at the river. I mean, it's the history and the richness of this film, you leave no stone unturned, yet you leave every stone where exactly where it was. And I really respect that. I, are, are you uh, involved in nature? Do you, do you spend your free time in nature? I love nature. Nature is really uh, my spiritual haven, I would say. Uh, although I grew up in cities, Mexico City, I lived in New York City before I came out to Santa Barbara, uh, I've always felt that nature was, uh, was the place where I, could, I, 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 I was at peace and I felt a spiritual connection with, with the world. So when I bought a cabin up here, I, just, I was curious to learn more and more about the birds, the wildlife, and uh, I actually started filming them before I even knew what I was going to do with the, <laughs> the footage. Excellent. So it kind of had a, took on a life of its own. Now is that your cabin in the scene where the woodpecker is knocking at the cabin? I almost half expected somebody <laughs> to open the door and say hello. <laughs> it is indeed, and uh, we hear a lot of that knocking going on. There's a lot of acorns in my, in my cabin. Do you ever think that it's someone at the door? Oh, yes. Yeah, several. And uh, you, you could definitely think it's someone at the door. That's excellent. Now, there are 67 nesting bird species within the area, the most in California, you mentioned in the film. Why do you think that the Santa Ynez River Valley houses so many species of birds? Well, I think Christina Sandoval really summarizes it best. Uh, the Santinez River Wilderness encompasses, I think, five different uh, habitats, from the oak woodland to the riparian area to the grasslands to the um, chaparral and uh, scrub oak. Each one of them have their own species, and there are, you know, there's a lot of overlap, but that richness of species and intermingling of habitats has created an environment where so many different birds and uh, a huge variety of wildlife have been able to thrive. 
It's really amazing. I mean, some of the footage of the fossils of dolphins and the geological tectonic plates where you talk about that and the fact that the, the ocean used to be there, it's almost like this magical place that exists and, you know, the, the Chumash depended on the acorn for sustenance, the woodpecker depends on the acorn, Very true. Uh, the bears, the black bears. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like a legacy of spirits within that area, a little Eden in and of itself. And I really love the part where she, uh, Christina talks about how she knew it was the right place to buy when she saw the yellow banana slug. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, um, can you tell me a little bit about your research for this film? Because between Shakespeare, quotes, and you know, you know everything about this area. How how long did you research it? Well, I worked on the film for four years, but that was between um, other projects, film projects I was doing, more commercial projects. And, uh, and over the period of, of doing it, whenever I would film something that I didn't uh, recognize, I would, I would you know, I have a whole library of books and uh, I would look it up. Of course, we've got the internet now too. And uh, I went, actually took some courses at City College in geology. Oh, wow. That's how I connected with the geologist that's in the film. So it, the research took place over a period of, of years. Oh, and wow. uh, and I, I just was fascinated. I'm an amateur, though, uh, com when I compare to the people that are in, you know, the scientists that are in the film. But I really, I'm an amateur in the sense of loving it, right. you know, which is the origin of the word. Okay, well, right now, let's take a look at a clip. In late summer, the bright yellow chicken mushroom appears. A choice edible that tastes like, you guessed it, frog's legs. Descriptions of the Valley Oak's remarkable stature appear in the diaries of many early visitors to California. In 1796, English explorer George Vancouver wrote with awe of these stately lords of the forest. Valley Oak riparian forests support 67 nesting bird species, more than any other California habitat. How much of a budget did you have for this film? <laughs> well, the budget was really um, the commercial film, the screenwriting project that I had, uh, which was concurrent. Okay. And uh, so I, I financed the film myself, okay. which gives me freedom to really do what I want. And uh, it really wasn't that expensive to make. Okay. I don't think I've even counted. <laughs> uh, a labor of love, they say, exactly, right? Exactly. Excellent. And you also composed music for the film. I know you were mentioning that earlier in your life you were an aspiring musician, but it seems like that still has a, a, a pull on your heart. Can you talk about that? Uh, absolutely. I, I love music. I love playing music. I still uh, play piano, jazz piano primarily. and. Um, uh, for the film, uh, my wife actually suggested that I play a, a variation on Summertime, which was to, uh, just loosely associated with the, with the theme, and uh, had a lot of fun doing that. It was just an improvisation, and we used that in the film. The other piece for Spring was something that I've been playing for a few years, so uh, that, it was great that that worked also with the film. It's beautiful. At times, we have the, the natural sounds, but then we go into this music, and it's it's hauntingly beautiful, and I, I just I respect that. And you know, you're you're a well-rounded artist, so thank you for sharing oh, well, your music with us. Thank you. I would like to talk now about a controversial subject, and in Santa Barbara County, we have a lot of fires: the Tea Fire, the Jesusita Fire. Now, in the film, fires are actually friendly. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? Well, I don't, you know, they were part of the transformative uh, nature of, of this landscape. And all the, uh, most of the plants and the uh, and animals are uh, fire adapted in some way. As Christina says, there's moths and butterflies that actually cover themselves with gravel and the firewall can go right over them and they come out unscathed. Plus there's things, plants like the blue lilac which will not sprout. The seeds uh, won't sprout unless there is a fire. Uh, burls, which are in most of the chaparral plants, also uh, are fire.
fire safe, so to speak. Most of the oaks will survive a fire. So the landscape is used to fire. Humans, not so much. And of course, most of the fires that we've had in Santa Barbara are, are started by humans. Right. So uh, I, there probably are more fires now than there were before uh, uh, Europeans moved into this area. I found it very interesting, even the point where she mentions that you know, these plants can burn and they'll still survive, their roots will still survive. So it's amazing that, you know, a lot of people think negatively upon these fires, but, you know, maybe we don't need to build mansions up in, in, up in these places and, and let it be with nature. Um, well, that is risky, uh, but you know, of course, uh, the trade-off is that you're in an, an incredibly beautiful environment. So no, we I all want a piece. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. How do you come about selecting your projects? Because your films are very different from each other. Historical epics, documentaries, fiction. You have a film called Gabby about a physically disabled girl who becomes a writer. What makes you decide on choosing a, a topic? Well, ultimately, it's passion because uh, when you make a film, you're committing it probably at least two years of your life to the making of it. Uh, some of those films uh, I was a screenwriter of, others I actually direct, wrote, and produced. But um, the ones where I'm a screenwriter, um, uh, I, sometimes it's a writing assignment uh, that uh, I haven't chosen, and that happens as well. Uh, historical epics are kind of what I'm known for in Hollywood. Right. So this most recent film I had made last year was a big historical epic. I wrote two drafts of a script, and then I didn't know anything about it until I heard it was in production. <laughs> That's great. And that they had Peter O'Toole, Andy Garcia, this incredible cast. Uh, so incredible that happens cast. as well, where you write something and it, it uh, you hand it off and um, the film happens and as a screenwriter you're not associated with it after, after writing it. So we're going to take a look at a final clip, Michael. But it was great having you on the show. Oh, my pleasure. Is there anything that you would tell up-and-coming filmmakers, any advice that you can give them in, in the Santa Barbara County? Absolutely. Uh, I've, I've met filmmakers here who have an idea for a project, really want to make it, but are waiting for something. They're waiting for financing, they're waiting for the right camera, the right gear. My message is, go out there, make your movie. Because it's so possible now with, with, this, with uh, digital gear, if you have a strong story, go out, make your film, you'll learn from it, next time you'll make a better film. The first uh, feature documentary that I made with my wife was made on these little Canon power shots. Really? At 15 frames per second. No external audio. And uh, it got into the Santa Barbara Film Festival and it's been in uh, you know, art uh, festivals all over uh, well, Canada, Europe, and, and here. Wow. So you can do it with very little the key is a good story and, uh, and passion. Well, Michael, I'd like to thank you for being on the show. It was our pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much Welcome for having me. Welcome back anytime. Great. We'll take a look at Fall thank you. right now from Santa Inez River Wilderness by Michael and Tina Love. Valley Oaks reach to the heavens, offering a brief song of color before they stand bare 